Murtuka National Park is recognised internationally as an outstanding example of human expression, innovation and survival. A lasting partnership between Aboriginal people and the broader community that balances the protection of its ancient and living heritage with the substantial use of the region's natural resources. Aboriginal people have occupied, used and managed the Burrup Peninsula for hundreds of generations. This is recorded on country, its special places and rich archaeology. This long history of occupation, ownership and management with joint partnerships through education, promoting awareness and sharing knowledge, therefore opening doors to more of an understanding the importance of our sacred Nora land. Ensuring the protection of this significant ancient historical area, reviving Ngāri Ngāri, Aboriginal knowledge, associations and responsibilities are that of our custodian and traditional customs. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2017 Pilbara Economic Conference, another fantastic event showcasing innovation, technology and economic development opportunities at its highest level. Congratulations to all involved in the coordinating of this wonderful event. I would like to acknowledge the Noongar traditional owners, the Wajak Budjar peoples on behalf of Morajuga and surrounding Pilbara region. We thank you for the opportunity and for your hospitality. We respectfully recognise all traditional owners, the First Nations people of the past, present and future generations, those who were killed defending this country and those who fought for this land through political means defining our identity. We are grateful for their strength, wisdom and sacrifice, which have ensured that we have opportunities denied to them in their lives. Wandawa, hello. My name is Raylene Cooper. I'm the chairperson for Murujuga Aboriginal Corporation. I am a mother than a traditional owner, like my great-grandmothers and mothers before me. I follow my law and culture, practising and passing on traditional customs. Handing down cultural law, knowledge, songs, language and dance are our stories. Maingura and surrounding areas in the Pilbara regions are a part of me, as direct descendants keeping, my close, keeping close my ancestral bloodlines, which bound me to my traditional law and customs connecting me to Maingura. This is who I am and whom I've become, a strong cultural Aboriginal woman. This is my identity. I am one of four, the 1,400 members, traditional owners who make Murujuga. The Murujuga Corporation, MAC, represents the five traditional owner groups from Murujuga, which are the Burrup Peninsula and the Dampier Archipelago. These groups are Inyamari, Nalama, Mathadunia and Nyabra and Wangatu peoples. Murujuga to us is the most culturally significant place on earth with more than one million petroglyphs over 40,000 years of occupation. It is of critical importance to our local Aboriginal people, but we also hope to the broader community. To us, Murujuga is a place of worship and understanding. It is where our stories begin. It is our Bible, it is our law book. Our law is written through the petroglyphs in the Munda, the stone that we believe is as enduring as the land itself. If I can take you through a brief history of MAC. Under an act of WA Parliament known as the Burrup and Maitland Industrial Estates Agreement, the BIMIA, was under threat of compulsory acquisition. Murujuga Aboriginal Corporation was formed. Under the BIMIA, MAC, having relinquished its native title land rights, land claims for state residential, commercial and industrial development, owns freehold title for Murujuga National Park, approximately 14 4,913 hectares, which adjoins the industrial land. However, this land was compulsorily leased back to the state on a 99-year lease to be joint managed as the 100th National Park. Today we recognise that working on our country includes coexisting with facilities and activities of the resources industries that exist there, but that MAC holds the key responsibility for the stewardship and management of the land and sea according to Aboriginal law and culture. Formed by MAC, the Murujuga Circle of Elders has been embraced by the community as the body for cultural knowledge and guidance around a range of activities on country. This has, inclu this has included guiding the work of the Murujuga Rangers, passing on oral knowledge, culture and law. This has increased the awareness and standing of the Circle of Elders, as well as deliver enhanced understanding of culture for our Rangers and broader Murujuga community. This allows the community to speak with one spiritual and cultural voice with strength and integrity. The MSLU, Murujuga Land and Sea Unit. MAC Rangers work on country, covering our land and sea reserves. However, we are still working towards obtaining government and legislative jurisdictional authority over these areas. So we are able to empower our rangers through education and training, upskilling, 
setting the foundations necessary for advanced study at its highest levels, providing sorry, at its highest levels, providing the skills to effectively manage and, proje and protect our water, our flora, fauna, and our marine environment surrounding the Murrajuga National Park and the 42 islands of the Dampier Archipelago. Their work currently includes cultural awareness inductions, conducting patrols and collecting environmental and heritage records to assist with compiling of data relevant to law and culture on sacred sites. If you like, we are building a library of information for past, current and future generations. Murujuga is committed to, surround, to sourcing business, businesses, op, business opportunities, sorry, with visions of expansion for MSLU's already successful Ranger program and our existing tyre power and Northwest Four Drive business, which is also 100% Mac owned and operated. Also including our exciting future project, the Living Knowledge Centre. With these enterprises, future projects, we are looking for ways to further develop and enhance our business opportunities. Looking to work with organisations either in partnership or project collaboration. It's our focus that these relationships are based on allowing growth, creating training, upskilling and local employment for our people. It is with great enthusiasm that my colleagues and I are here today to, to present to you the Pilbara Edible Oyster Research and Development Project. Murujoga, in partnership with Maxima Pearls and the Pilbara Development Commission have been working in collaboration to investigate and collate the economic feasibility for the business development of edible oyster production in the Pilbara. We have identified desired areas to facilitate the project research farm, enabling further economic testing assumptions, formulating and executing strategic direction in developing economic business, setting the foundations to build, creating security and st stability, engaging employment and training opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time today and I truly appreciate your invitation to be here to explain to you det in detail the Pilbara Edible Oyster Project. It's my pleasure to introduce to you my colleague, mate and mentor, Managing Director of Maxima Pearls, Mr John Hutton. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, especially thank you to, uh, to Ray Lane and her board and especially Craig Bonney for um, welcoming uh, me and my family uh, into their uh, into their world and uh, and really uh, yeah, creating this uh, a unique partnership and uh, to try and uh, bring alive a um, I suppose a, an industry that maybe even kicked off uh, some of the uh, the Pilbara back in the 1870s with the pearling industry um, so that's probably your first uh, your first uh, livestock industry that did kick off uh, in the area so also thank you to Pilbara Ports Authority I'm sure we'll be dealing hopefully uh, with the success of this project uh, together uh, down the track. Um, what I'll do is, uh, is, is hopefully uh, get through this 10 minutes and seven, um, five, four, uh, really quickly. And uh, just, it's at the early stages, we're still in the, in the, in the process of getting exemptions for, to grow uh, the oysters uh, and trial them out. So it's a, it's a research and development project. There's a lot of uh, gaps in knowledge as to uh, what we need to, uh, to complete to, uh, to get to a, uh, a commercial pilot scale. So uh, it's a gap knowledge uh, R&D trial. So um, we'll run through that uh, for the moment. Yep. So a snapshot of Australian aquaculture. Um, total seafood in, uh, in Australia is, uh, is two and a half billion a year. So that's wild catch as well. Approximately, and, and, and getting very, very quickly uh, to 50% uh, of that production is, uh, is aquaculture product, and most of that is, uh, is actually out of Tasmania with salmon, uh, Atlantic salmon, imported species. It employs 14,000 people, and, and in Australia, the, uh, the focus is on uh, high-value niche product. Um, with the rock oyster uh, industry in Australia, it's mainly focused around New South Wales, South Australia and Tasmania, and everyone will be uh, uh, familiar with the Sydney rock oysters and the, uh, the Pacific oyster out with uh, Coffin Bay um, branding. So it's a $100 million industry and uh, 16 and a half million dozen uh, in 2007. So that's, uh, there's an opportunity uh, with some recent events on the, uh, in, that, uh, in that East Coast industry for Western Australia. Interesting, this next slide. So 
The, uh, the Western Australia uh, stats up the top left and on the, uh, on the far right, and then you go down, compare it to Tasmania, uh, two thirds of the way down and on the far right. So what we've got, Western Australia has uh, 20,781 kilometres of coastline, which is four times more the coastline of Tasmania, but we produce 3% of the value of aquaculture production out of, uh, of Tasmania. So $114,530 per kilometre for Tasmania, $3,500 for Western Australia. You can see that there's um, a, a fantastic opportunity for Western Australia to, uh, to have a go at this and, uh, and produce um, aquaculture of various species. So the tropics, the, uh, the temperate zones and, and also the, uh, the southern areas. Our focus on the, uh, on the oyster here in the, uh, in the Pilbara. So the growth opportunity. There's a uh, new legislation that's, uh, that's come in. Um, new regulations are due by the 1st of January uh, 2019. It's going to be combining the Pearling Act and the Fish Resource Management Act so that of all of the Pearling leases, so 60, what have we got, 63,000 uh, hectares of the marine real estate in Western Australia are uh, Pearling and aquaculture and 60,000 are Pearling leases. So, the GFC really kicked us in the guts with the pearling industry. Um, so we were only allowed to grow pearls uh, on those leases. So what we want is the opportunity to, uh, for this new legislation to, and regulations to come in so that, that uh, already a pre-approved marine real estate has the opportunity to grow other species. So um, our family's got uh, pre-approved leases in the Pilbara and uh, we're really keen to, uh, to work with the TOs uh, in the area to, uh, to advance this project. The state uh, is investing in a multi-species mollusk hatchery down in, ha in Albany, and uh, the brood stock from that, uh, down in that uh, hatchery, uh, actually came from the Carnarvon uh, Onslow area um, almost 30 years ago. Why aquaculture in the Pilbara? Well, obviously in the 1870s, where the pearling industry started, and uh, then later in the uh, in the middle of uh, last century, the, uh, the, the cultural of, uh, of pearls uh, also kicked off. It's got large areas of protected water. There's good water quality, large tidal flows. Uh, there's, while there's limited urban development at the moment, obviously the, uh, the big picture stuff that's being put out by, uh, by everyone at the moment and, uh, and the energy generation, it's certainly going to be attracting a lot of people to the, to the Pilbara, but it also attracts a lot of market for us as well. Good transport links and obviously close to the Asian markets. The support from the Pilbara Development Commission has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, the state has a statement of commitment to uh, aquaculture and um, I think there's, uh, the focus on, uh, on aquaculture in this state is, uh, is really being defined and, uh, and will do so over the next couple of years. Interestingly, in the, uh, in the Eyre Peninsula in South Australia, they have a seafood trail. I think this, is, uh, this can also work in with the Pilbara Development Commission's uh, tourism strategy and with uh, the Murrajuga and their, uh, their cultural centre um, in, uh, out at uh, Murrajuga and Flying Foam Passage. Okay, which species? Well, the Pilbara Development Commission uh, worked with the, uh, the Fisheries WA to identify the potential species. The Western Rock Oyster is the, uh, is the key uh, species that we're targeting. And, um, but as we found out there's, uh, there's a need to do these R&D trials just to ad address the risks and challenges and the knowledge gaps before we move to uh, full commercial scale. The partners in this, ro ro in this rock oyster project, Murujuga, have been absolutely fantastic. There's economic development opportunities, real jobs on country and complementing the tourism. Uh, the Pilbara Development Commission is really uh, uh, backing this project. A really fantastic support from the city of Caratha. Our company, our family company, has got pre-existing leases, uh, lazy vessels and infrastructure that's uh, waiting for the new legislation and regulations to kick in so that we can uh, utilise people as well as, uh, as capital. And uh, we've got the experience in the, uh, in the technical side of things to kick this thing along. Uh, the FRDC is being really supportive of this and is, uh, is our major, uh, major financial sponsor. Obviously, there's uh, what are the risks and what are the uh, advantages? Um, the rock oyster population, natural, exi there's existing pre-approved uh, real estate and marine real estate. Uh, we've successfully grown pearl oysters in Flying Foam Passage before. 
we've got that knowledge, we've got uh, capital uh, infrastructure that's, uh, that's available to be used. The, uh, the oyster hatchery down in Albany is going to be a fantastic uh, source of broodstock, of, uh, of spat, sorry, and, uh, and obviously the transport links and the complementary of the tourism industry. Our risks, the quality uh, assurance program, food assurance program, so that's going to be key to obviously you know, the food area. Um, we need to make sure that uh, everything's uh, healthy for, um, whether it be from uh, a heavy metals uh, study to uh, to be able to take the oysters from, from the water to the port and then also export. So we have got to have all those uh, health and food regulations in place. Biosecurity and disease risks, there's already a fair, fair amount of uh, biosecurity operated by the port authorities. So uh, we'll also be uh, looking to link in with those types of uh, uh, systems and procedures. We need to study the growth rates and survival rates and, uh, and also find the little hidey spots where we can uh, make sure we stay out of the way of cyclones. The R&D project, we're going to target uh, a thousand dozen oysters to start with and it's obviously, as I've mentioned before, the growth rates, survival rates, uh, what are the seasonal conditions for the markets as well. Um, I think uh, we should be able to compete with, uh, with the uh, eastern states markets with, uh, with a fantastic uh, product that already exists out there. Uh, the Shellfish Quality Assur Assurance Program uh, and that will do all the, uh, the human health and ongoing water and oyster sampling uh, uh, programs. Uh, many of you know Flying Foam Passage, uh, our existing purling lease is, uh, is out the front just inside uh, Legionda Island and uh, we're looking to look at a couple of those, uh, those smaller hiding spots inside uh, some of those, um, the islands there. Species and equipment, the Western Rock Oyster, Circustre Cucullata and also the Tropical Black Lip Oyster which occurs mainly in the Kimberley uh, down to this area, but um, we'll mainly be tasking, targeting that uh, Western Rock Oyster. There is existing IP, so it's not, we don't have to reinvent the wheel up uh, in the Pilbara. There's an ability to, uh, to utilise uh, the input of uh, some of the New South Wales and South, South Australian systems. Flying Foam Passage versus Coffin Bay. We're basically, it's exactly the same size. So we've got an opportunity here in a small uh, compact area to be able to produce a fantastic and what I see as an indigenous Pilbara branded product. So that's going to be uh, that's going to be how we're going to be operating is is to work alongside the uh, the most known oyster product in Australia, the Coffin Bay oyster. It's got 40 independent uh, growers that feed into that um, that cooperative. So we've got an opportunity to uh, to compete with that. Employs over 100 people. It's remote, 700 k's from Adelaide, but it still gets its product to market. Uh, those oysters were introduced in the 1970s. 20 years later, commercial production began. Now, I would expect if our trials become uh, uh, successful, then we will be uh, producing 60,000 dozen oysters out of Flying Foam Passage. Just a footnote to the end. One second over. This is a note for, for everyone that uh, these pearl oyster leases or these uh, oyster growing areas are not, um, are not exclusive areas, uh, doesn't it restrict any fishing or recreational use, and, uh, but uh, it was just a note to say that um, they're not exclusive, but if we're up there working with you guys, we want to make it successful, and uh, if you're up there visiting and in two years' time we've got uh, lots of oysters to eat, we'd like to see you down the, uh, down the markets or on the port um, scoffing away with a bottle of champagne. Right, thank you very much.